I'm Philip Beither, Senior Curator for Performing Arts at the Walker Art Center. And next to me is Young Jean Lee, who's a playwright and director and creator of two works that have been here at the Walker. Um, the latest one called Church just uh, opened last night, um, though the work is close to a year and a half old. Mm -hmm, and, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it's a work that the Walker helped co-commission. And the previous piece was Songs of Dragons Flying to Heaven, uh, which was a work that was part of our Out There Festival two years ago um, and was actually the first, I think, the first work that you really took outside of New York um, in the States and was mm -hmm. a kind of first touring stop for you. And I, I wondered if we could start with kind of going back two years ago and that, that moment of the experience of having your work leaving a community of the downtown theater world and going out into um, the heartland and uh, how um, how it was to you know to sort of be on the road with your work and see it in a different context and with a different kind you know, somewhat of a different kind of audience and you know in in the Midwest and that that kind of thing and what what um, maybe what you um, you know what you gained from the start of having your work now that is actively touring um, you know get on the road Things. Sorry, what was the last part of your question? Just what you, what you maybe uh, was helpful to, or, or what you found uh, maybe different about your work being, you know, on the road versus in theaters that you used to be working with in New York. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, it always varies from theater to theater and, you know, city to city, like right. how your work is received. Yeah. But, you know, I've generally found a weird degree of universality in huh. terms of people's responses, you know? So in touring, you know, it, it because like even in New York from night to night, there's huge differences right, right. In, in audience. Audience to audience. Yeah, but I, you know, I haven't felt, um, you know, I mean, I, th I would say like the biggest, the biggest difference is just like, you know, audience size, like right. how full the audience is, like that right. tends to make the biggest difference. So mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in some venues, we were in these huge, gigantic venues, right. and like not enough right. people to fill them, and that really changed the vibe. Yeah, but, right, right. Um, but in terms of, you know, I, I feel like the work is, is kind of, I mean, so far, at least... It's, you know, in Europe and the United States, you know, right. in, the, in the places that we've gone, it seems to have sort of like this kind of universal quality. And, and people uh, connect with it at the certain points that you expect, you know, that, that have been seen in New York or elsewhere and things like that. And right, right. And, 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 and in Europe, we found that the response, I mean, if, if, we, if we rank the cities in terms of like who liked our work the best, <laughs> the, the ranking, you know, follows along exactly with um, how, how good people's English is in oh, that particular huh. city. So like Norway, people just went crazy and their huh. English is just phenomenal, you right. know, and so it's like, you know, it was just about how much they could understand. Sure. And in France or places that um, maybe their English isn't as strong, uh, have you found it difficult for audiences? Uh, it's a little bit, well, you know, not quite. Like the universal quality still comes through, but it's just like they don't, they don't get it as much because right. they're following along with subtitles. Oh, sure. And so they're right. only getting, you know, a certain level right. of it. But visually they're getting everything. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's, so I think the experience varies a little bit in that sense. But it just in terms of where people are coming from culturally, for some reason with my work that, I don't think, think think it's made a huge difference. Do you find that, I mean, I, I hadn't planned to ask you this, but I'm curious about with, with your work in Europe, there's such a history of, um, of, of racial tension and a, a unique history of America mm -hmm. that, um, that your work uh, emanates out of. Do you find that there's a lack of understanding or um, uh, um, some, some um, just uh, different responses in Europe than in the States around, especially around issues when you confront issues of race uh, in your work? Well, you know, there are always going to be people who, you know, who say, like, you know, I don't think race is an issue anymore. Like, even, you know, Americans will say right. that, you know. But, but yeah, we definitely got some, some Europeans who said, well, race really isn't an issue here for mm -hmm. us, you know. But for every person who said that, there's yeah. another person who said that's total BS. Right. Like there right. is definitely a racial problem. So right. you know, in general, we found that you know, in general, we found that people, you know, even if uh, that that ever that most sort of intelligent people in cities had a sense of what the racial tensions were and right. did respond right. sort of similarly. I'd like to go back a little bit to the making of church, which we just saw. It was so great to see again last night and. Uh, and I wondered, um, you know, if you could put yourself back when you first started thinking about making that piece, um, what what was your motivation in 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 taking 
on uh, the, the, the questions around a spiritual, a, a, a religious ceremony, and the questions of placing a kind of church-like service in the context of a contemporary theater um, setting? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, like all of my work is about sort of stirring up my own complacency, like knocking, right. knocking it down. And, um, you know, I just felt like I just noticed that one issue that I was really complacent about and most of my friends were really complacent about, you know, being most of us liberal atheists was right. Christianity. There was just this really sort of smug attitude towards mm. Christians as right. being these kind of, you know, rubes right. or, you know, like seriously deluded freaks or something like that. And, and I think especially during maybe the Bush years, it oh was, yeah. I think Christians were viewed as responsible in, in certain circles as responsible for most of the negative things happening in the country. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So like the source of all evil and right. you know and so I realized that that was one area in which I was had these really sort of like weirdly narrow minded like I who consider myself to be really open minded I was incredibly narrow minded huh. and sort of bigoted actually huh. like um, right. towards towards Christians and so you know I set myself the challenge of seeing if I could make a show that would manage to bust through my own complacency and resistance to the topic. Because I was actually kind of traumatized by religion when I was growing up, just right. because, you know, it's like, it's it's very, you know, my parents were just so concerned about the state of my soul and just like constantly right. pushing it on me and I never wanted it. And so, you know, I definitely have a really bad reaction to any kind of religious. Do you think though that the fact that you grew up in a strictly religious um, family, that uh, the fact that they're your parents, um, Despite your your mixed feel, your strong re negative reaction to being raised in that way, gave you an empathy around conf you know kind of trying to meet Christianity halfway or you know being able to even um, take on the subject matter. In some Definitely, way? yeah. I mean, because I, I, cause this whole model of Christians as these like evil idiots, right. you know, it it just didn't fit with my parents because yeah. they're neither, right. you know, and right. so. Um, you know, a part of it was just wanting to like sort of understand, understand them and sort of be more open and, you know, and, right. and find, you know, find what was valuable, what is valuable in this religion. Like, you mm. know, because all these people are human beings, they're deriving something of right. worth from, right. you know, from believing these yeah. things. And I just wanted to get at the source of what that was and just channel it in a show in a way that a secular audience could feel that goodness and uh. feel that value and uh. that support in in a context that was neither like homophobic nor right. minded or, you know. And that was part of the strategy of making the preacher and the service really um, liberal and mm -hmm. very sort of uh, progressive in its attitude. Some of, even the, li the, the list of things that that I think Weena says about you know what we stand for, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a it was something that I think you knew your audience would immediately connect with and suddenly kind of buy them some favor. Exactly, some, uh, exactly. Yeah, that was one of one of the one of the many strate strategies. It's interesting in the Twin Cities because many people, and I've attended quite a bit often, um, things like uh, Unitarian Church services and mm -hmm. things where people who normally might be in the atheist camp. Uh, and they all but say, well, we don't believe in God, or, you know, we may not be, or we, it's fine if you don't, you know, but it's a sort of progressive gathering of folks who mm -hmm. want to have some kind of spiritual sort of something to get to attend. Um, so I was curious how the audience here in Minnesota would respond, you know, to the work. Did you have any sense of uh, how, how what, what you got from the audience last night? Very similar to New York, actually, uh -huh. which is like, you know, people falling, you know, all along the religious spectrum, right. you know, having right. a very similar response to the show, which was, you know, um, one of like in incredible sort of thoughtfulness and, right. um, you know, and I, I just went and huh. spoke to all these high school students at Perpich yeah. and, How'd you know, go? and yeah. it was, it was great. Like they were so smart and they were so, you know, they, they, they were from like a range of different backgrounds right. in terms of religion. And, you know, it was, it was so nice to see everybody sort of like come together in agreement that huh. they had sort of responded to this show huh. and, you know, the kind of discussion that it opened up. I mean, I feel Did like... Did they see the layers that you intended uh, in the, in the work? Absolutely. Yeah. It was That's amazing. Great. Like they, they, you know, they had a more sort of subtle understanding of it than a lot of just you know adult audience right. members have. Yeah. Like they really picked up on, um, they really picked up on, you know, do I laugh? Am I supposed to laugh? Am I not right. supposed to laugh? Yeah. Like what, you know, right. like why is this funny? And just like really yeah. questioning themselves. Right. And I feel like, you know, the, with the shipment and with church, the big development, um, the uh, the shipment being my sure. current show Your in New York. York. Yeah. Um, 
uh, the big difference with those two shows is I feel like, um, um, you know, and this is kind of a weird thing to say, but I feel like these shows, there's something about the way that they're built that makes the audience have intelligent responses. Hmm. What, what is that, do you think? Uh. I don't know. I mean, uh. I, think, I think it might be that we worked so hard with both of these shows to seal off escape hatches, right. like dismissive escape hatches. Right. And I feel like once people don't have their easy out and right. they're left in sort of a thoughtful state, sure. it makes them really smart and really sensitive mm. because they're thinking, right. you know, right. as opposed to like dismissing or judging or, right. you know. I thought every time you c came close to a, a parody of a, of a religious service or a, a sort of over-the-top um, satire, um, you pulled back and made it very, it was very heartfelt. And I think that kept left the audience question, you know, it never allowed them to fall into just making fun in mm -hmm. any way at all. Mm -hmm. um, there was an interesting moment, I, I wondered what your response to this was, um, that I thought was very uh, discomforting and um, almost concerning when the one of the church ladies asks for people to pr to pray about certain things, mm -hmm. and I, I just imagined, and I think I remember in New York, they were uh, perhaps a little bit more frivolous things, or people were in on a sort of joke of like, I want that I can get a cab after the mm -hmm, show or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And here suddenly last night, one woman says, one man says that let's pray for o the Obama safety, and uh -huh. the next person says for my friend who's dying of cancer. And it's like this hush came over the house, and it was a very delicate, um, I was uh, uh, kind of nervous about it, because some, uh, everyone was really already there as almost like they were in a church service, mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. could have so easily sort of, um, if something very you know, funny or ironic happened right after that, it could have... Uh, really lost any sense of trust within the audience in some way? Oh, I definitely. Don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that moment is all about, uh, uh, that moment is, is, is a moment in which the audience gets to test. So in New York, people would say, you know, I'd like to pray for gay marriage. And then right. when they see that the people pray for gay marriage, you know, I'd like to pray for my dog's diarrhea, they pray very sincerely for your dog's diarrhea. Huh. Like, it sets up the rules. You uh, know, which is which is basically that whatever you bring is going to be supported and taken right. seriously. You uh, know, and that right. there's no, you know, um, you know, and they're just, you know, they're supposed to like accept anything that comes. Oh, that's, you know, that's and you know, when I said if anybody says anything really obnoxious, you know, you yeah. need to just like, you know, love. You know, if somebody says something, if somebody said something like really like vulgar and sexist to one right. of the girls, like yeah. you know, I would say, you know, you you should say, you know, what's your name, please? Like, would you please help, you know, so and so for something very general. Huh. Like as he, you know, right. uh, would you please help him this evening? Like something, you know, just so that it's yeah. like they respond with love right. to everything. Did it ever make you uncomfortable when people, you know, so quickly, like last night, you know, get very personal and they're really? No, I mean uh, it happened in New York also. It, yeah. yeah, it did. We we're we're pretty used to that happening. Uh -huh. Like sometimes nobody says anything, but you know, like people. Uh, I feel like there's something about the opening song combined with that opening monologue right. that yeah. kind of sets Opens the tone, and then and then, and then the you know and then the girls coming out and saying like the whole beginning of the service is very non gimmicky, right. you know, in sure. terms of like what happens. And right. so I think you know when people request a prayer, in a way, it's like. Uh, it's, I just feel like it's testing. Hmm. When people do a prayer request in that moment, I mean, so for some people it might be, you know, but they're, they know they're in a theater service, sure, and I feel right. like they're testing to see how sincere is this, oh, you know, huh. how real is this, right. you know, and I feel like that's what that moment is for, huh. you know, and then they, you know, they realize that it's, you know. Right. Could you comment on um, what you see as the parallels or, or just how you, how you navigated the theater of theater and the theater of religious ceremony, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, how you equated those two or, I mean, suddenly it's a very different context, but at the same time, there's similar things, you know, between the theater we see in churches and things. Um, well, I mean, the concept behind the show was basically that, you know, these four people are a touring church. Right. And it's uh, not, right. and it is sort of theatrical. And they don't, yeah. and they, they, they play to venues like this, you know, sometimes right. in churches, you know, they're going around. So it's not, it's not pretending that this is their a church, this is a church and, yeah. and this is their congregation, like right. they're touring, sure. like they thank the Walker Arts Center. Yeah, right? yeah, right. And, um, 
and and so you know and the idea is that these are sort of renegades you know mm. they've all uh. left their respective churches and they've formed their own church sure. that you know sort of uh, that that and and they have like um, you know, and it's a real religion, you mm, know, sure. it's enough of a religion that they can get like a local choir, right, you know, but, right. but um, that was sort of like the concept behind it so that it's not really in any way supposed to be a traditional church service. Like right. they do whatever they want. They sing, right. they dance, they do right. all the things they want to do. Right. Huh. Um, I, I'm wondering about, you know, when you decided to take on the subject, and this could be for any of your works, but what's your process of actually writing your work? I mean, what, do you sit down and, and just start writing the piece or do you test some things with, your, with potential performers or friends and try some things out and then go back and rewrite a lot and things like that? And um, well, I cast the show before I've written the piece, oh, and I, I cast them. That. That's right. You know, I cast them with people whom I feel I could trust as collaborators. Right. And um, and then I write parts for them. Is that them. A, a, always, always. How you do your Yeah. Uh -huh. And then and then I bring, I bring, I write parts for them. Bring them into the rehearsal room. We all talk about it. They say I like this. I don't like this. I don't respond to this. I mean, people. You know, the students were asking me today, like, how did you? You know, they feel like, I, you know, they said, I felt like you got me. Like, you kept getting me right. and, pe and pegging me, right. you know? And they said, right. like, how did you do that? And I said, well, the way that I did that was I would bring stuff into rehearsal, and the actors would tell me, well, you don't get me there. You don't get me there. I don't relate to that, you huh. know, blah, blah, blah. And then I would go and keep refining uh, and honing uh. and honing and honing until everybody in the room was like, all right, you got me, huh. you know? And so, you know, just to make it as sort of universally applicable as possible. I mean, universally is, like, you know, a dangerous word. Sure, but right. like like, you know, among is the that, group. Is that process then of, of really working through your works with a, with a group of artists that you, that you trust, performers, um, separate you from the process of many traditional playwrights who, you know, really, they write their script and they send it to the regional theater they hope will produce it, and they really never hear the language until there's maybe a reading or something like that. I mean, is, do you see that as a distinctly different way? Oh, of yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know of anybody else who does that except for possibly Richard Foreman. But yeah. I know he comes in with text, you know, but, right. but he, like, my model came sort of out of his model. Yeah, sure. Um, it's sort of like a version of that. Yeah. But I don't, but I think it is very different. And, you know, since I write and direct at the same time, I think that the work has, like, a very different quality to right, it. Right, sure. Know. And Rich directs much of his work too, doesn't he? Oh, and yeah, yeah. Rich, I think Rich comes in with a script though yeah. and then refines. Right, right, yeah. Huh. I wondered if, um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the mix of language that you use because it, it's very uh, interesting how you balance this kind of heightened surrealist, um, almost like language that almost builds to a crescendo at times. It's quite, um, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, um, fl at times almost flowery and it's mm -hmm. very, uh, it really pulls you in in an imagistic way with uh, everyday sp speech to the kind of conversational language that you and I might use with each other. And there's a kind of, I, I sense like in church of this kind of back and forth a bit that also seems to pull audiences in and also then just give them a, a sort of set piece monologue that they can just sink into and things. Is that conscious or is it? Yeah, I mean it was, um, you know, I, I considered just doing um, the entire show just in the really straightforward vernacular, you know, vernacular. Kind of, yeah. and then and then I realized that there was a sort of dishonesty to that mm. you know and and you know for me like I sort of had to address the fact that you know the major issue for me growing up with religion was just how crazy everything sounded you know like all of the stories <laughs> from the Bible like the miracles it right, just sounds sure. insane right you know you have a character and even say that uh, last night like right, right 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 you right know. and and so you know and so I kind of like you know, I guess the point that I ended up making was, you know, it sounds like, you know, it's like the stuff that he's saying is really kind of meaningless. Like yeah, he's talking right. about mummies, it's just like nonsense. Right, and sometimes he, like the thought is never even quite finished. <laughs> yeah, it just moves exactly, on and, yeah. exactly. It's just like, it's really, I tried to make it as nonsensical as possible. Right. And yet he's so heartfelt yeah. and he's so sincere and somehow the message is still there. Like right. he's still making his message uh. and the nonsense has neither really harmed nor hindered. Right. It's just... Theatrical, you know, yeah, it's, sure. you know, it's it's just a part of it. So, so you know, to that extent, I'm kind of, you know, it's not just Christianity that has the weird stuff. Like every religion right. has some like really weird stories, right. you know. So that was kind of uh. a nod 
to that sure. reality of religion to me. Like uh. the fact that, you know, it's, it's, it's like, yes, a lot of it sounds nonsensical, you know, but at the same time, it doesn't, you know, you can yeah. still, there's still something of value in sure. it, you know, so you go through all this nonsense and instead of at the end of it being like, oh, see, that's why it's worthless. Right. That's when all the real value starts coming in, uh, you know, it uh. doesn't, you know. Did you ever worry that it, or I guess you probably had to work hard at, that if he sp spins out too, into too weir of the weird land, um, that he, he'll lose the, tr the people will just say, this guy's just out, out, out to lunch, um, the audience, because you're trying to maintain that sense of like, oh, that's, that people care about him as a pre or that they're partly bought into him as a preacher and things. Uh, it's weird. He can actually push it pretty far. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's like we're so... Um, we're so vigilant about the sincerity that I think it would just be like almost impossible for him as an to actor lose to, to lose it completely right. and yeah. to like break out. But I, you know, I feel like no matter how, we've had nights where the audience is just like, you know, dying with laughter right. during that section. Uh. But as soon as you get to, you know, the song right. and the, and the, and the prayer and then the dance, like those moments are so absolutely sincere, sure. right. you know, and then all through the rest of the show, it's like comes back. Right. To you know, yeah. um, you know, to all of the like super feel good stuff. Yeah. So, um, I, I find it you know in the in the section of um, you know at the beginning and the different parts of the piece, you're, you know, the, there's a this this kind of uh, savage critique of of the audience of of the people of people in general, and and it, uh, and you start with mostly just the young people, and then it's the older professionals, and then it's the slackers who have given up and things like that. But in, in other interviews, you've talked about that, you know, in your work, often what drives you or what, what, what it, you're doing is you're some sort of self-critique as mm -hmm. well as you find the things that maybe are, you're insecure about or that you are um, questioning yourself and then you lay that out as a question for everybody in the room. Um, and I wonder if it's maybe, A, like how you, you know, get up the courage to critique your, you know, to sort of get at, at the insides, insecurities that that harshly on yourself, uh, and B, if you think that's part of what then brings people in, into the work, is that there's this honesty that you've, it's not just about pointing the fingers at, at others in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really more of like a personal characteristic. Uh -huh. Like I, for some reason, I, I really, um, I don't get upset about criticism hmm. like I, I actually like really welcome it uh, you know it, it's it be because that's I mean I, I feel like that's how personal criticism or criticism of your work or um, any any kind uh, any even even personal criticism like hmm. it's like I always you know I always tell all of my staff and my crew and my actors like if anything that I do is irritating to you or is getting in your way you need to tell me right away so I can stop huh. and I'll be like really grateful for it you hmm. know because then that'll be like one less sort of crappy thing that's right, happening, you right. know? And so it's, you know, it's just kind of, um, uh, yeah, I would say it's like my one virtue is right. that I can take criticism. So yeah. for me, it's like a constant self-critique. Huh. And, you know, I, I, I've actually been criticized for that, you know, that I'm too self-critical hmm. and that I'm like too hard on myself. Right. But, you know, I don't really experience it as a destructive thing. Right. Like for me, sure. it, it's like, it's, it's constructive. Right. And, it's, and, and a lot of it is sort of tongue in cheek because it's yeah. not like, you know, you're, you're bad. Like, right. you know, I'm not sure. like beating myself up. Yeah, it's yeah. just sort of picking yourself apart right. and sort of making right. fun of yourself sure. and like not right. taking yourself very seriously. And that, right. I mean, for me, that's a kind of religion, you know, right. religious practice is yeah. like really rigorous and constant self critique. And I try to pull the audience into that as well. Do you find that um, this may we may have already answered this question, but you know the shipment and songs of dragons, um, you know, in some ways are more obviously, uh, in, you know, have a political point of view in a certain in, in its confrontation of of prejudice and, and racial stereotypes and things. Do you see church as a political work, and if so, how? how um? I mean, yeah, I definitely think that yeah. it's a you know a political work just in terms of like you know red and blue and right, you know right. and. Um, uh, you know, and and also just in the sort of like you know, there's there's a message going through it that's sort of about um, 
you know, like what are you doing with your life? Are you helping people? Because right. if you really go get to the heart of what their theology is, it's about it's about love, giving, and unselfishness. Huh. You know, right. and this like right. constant focus on like self improvement, like right. self, you know, self, self, self. Like right. that's the thing that's destructive. Right. And so, right. you know, um, you know, and then and, then, and they talk about like you know railing against political injustices and like not doing anything about right. it. Right. You know, and yeah. and and they say like you know making make, even making art about political subjects doesn't count as concrete action. Right, you which know? got a big so, response in the house Yeah, last time. yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, the shows are always sort of in danger of eating themselves right, because this right. self-critique is like, you know, just turns Woven in right itself. In. Yeah. yeah, but... Um, uh, yeah, I would I would say that it was a political show. I mean, yeah. you know, not not as overtly political, sure. but definitely. Well, I thought we might turn to um, you, you've just come off a really great success with the shipment, and is your new work, and uh, and I had the pleasure to see it a few a week or two ago, and and it's wonderful to see all the attention that the, the the piece has been getting. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you saw the shipment, you know, as as a next step, what you wanted to confront with that work after you made Church and after you had made Songs of Dragons, where you saw it as, a, as, a, as an advancement and what, what you wanted to take on with that piece? Well, I felt like Songs of the Dragons didn't really, you know, sort of get at the 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 root of the sort of racism that that disturbs me the most which mm. is sort of like institutional right you know institutional systemic right. racism yeah. and i felt like you know in uh in this country you know like where you see it the worst is in you know like the black communities and mm. you know right. sort of after Definitely. effects of slavery sure. and right. um and i you know, I, I wanted to see if I could do an identity politics show that was a black identity politics show, you know, as, you know, with, with the double challenges of one, you know, people at the time when I started the show being incredibly defensive about that subject, Be and two, um, with mine not being black. People being defensive, both white people as well as black people, black people because you're not black and... I think, no, I think it was, you know, it's the, that's the really weird thing, is that it's been amazing how, I mean, you know, like, knock on wood, I mean, maybe there are people out there who are angry about it, but in terms of, like, response from black audience members and the black community, it's been overwhelmingly supportive. Huh. Overwhelmingly great. supportive uh, and uh. generous. Uh, you know, I haven't gotten, you know, looked askance at right. even, you yeah. know, once, you know, so it's been uh, that which I thought was gonna be this huge obstacle, ended up not being an obstacle at uh, all. And the biggest issue was really like, you know, white defensiveness, huh. non, non-black defensiveness, I and, should say, and what, not white And were people willing to, um, to state that straight out or were they, what, did you find it was uh, um, uh, unspoken kind of defensiveness that people. Oh, it was. It was just. It was the ways in which they were dismissive. Uh, um, like, and I am not accustomed to being dismissed right, in that way. Right. You know, like yeah. it, it was. It was really upsetting for me. People you know? who saw the show. Uh, we did or, workshops. We did uh, workshops. We did two workshops last year, and I, I recast the show afterwards, and I also threw out all of the materials. So well, we. Well, and I know when anything. we first early on were talking about the piece, you were thinking of it as much more of a kind of hip hop musical in a certain way. And, yeah. And I know you decided to make a fairly significant shift. With yeah, the yeah. We, we totally threw all of that out the window. Um, and it was... Um, wait, I've lost track of Well, I was asking the about the defensiveness that people Oh, the defensiveness. And, and um, workshops and things. Yeah, people, people were... The way that they would uh, demonstrate their defensiveness would be they would just be so dismissive, you huh. know, and, and really condescending. Huh. And um, kind of, we've heard all this before. We've heard all this thing. before. This is too obvious. Like this is too. I'm like way more sophisticated than this. This is too simplistic. And, and so was some of it kind of like, oh, we're post race now, and you know, these are issues we you smart people have all already dealt with and confronted and things mm, like that. Or? And you know, it, it wasn't so much of that. Right. You know, I think that's more like the new thing the, now, the, like the, the post Obama. Obama yeah. yeah, but. Um, uh, no, it was really just like we've heard this all before, like blah blah blah, you know, all of those right. things, yeah. and and that was really, um, yeah, that was really difficult, uh. you know, and and sort of like laughing the wrong kind of laughter, the sort of like you know Dave Chappelle saying yeah. that he put comedy because you know he kept feeling the wrong kind of laughter, yeah. and there was a lot of that, you know, it was really difficult. I know you said that the other night that it sometimes is. Um, really disturbing to hear laughter at places that you, it's almost shocking because it's like, how could people be laughing? But in some ways your work 
um, emits a sort of uh, level of, of some kind of uncomfortableness that I think at times laughter is people's response when they don't know how to respond in mm -hmm, things. Or, mm -hmm. or it, it seems that you want people in a place where they're not entirely sure how to respond. And so I wondered if you could explain that a little more. Like You uh, can always tell it in your gut. I've become like uh -huh. a connoisseur of laughter after uh, all yeah. of these years of like touring and right. doing shows. And you know, and it's like I'm always listening for like what the laughter is like. And uh -huh. um, I don't know, you can always tell. You can always tell. So there's times tell. like in the shipment where you just cringe. Like I can't, like the type of laughter at a moment where you just thought, how could people be laughing yeah. in this way at this time? Yeah, there were there was like one per performance of the shipment where there were two white women who were just clearly laughing and completely the wrong way at completely the wrong things, and these two women just shifted the mood of the entire oh, wow. room. Like uh. it was really interesting how you know how these how these dynamics work, and it's something, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but it's something you can feel in your gut. Like yeah. I went to see. Um, you know, like I'll watch South Park yeah, and sometimes right. there will be some like offensive stuff on sure. there and I'll just sort of feel in my gut that it's okay. Like right. this is okay, this yeah. is a little dubious. It's just right. like this internal, you know, sure. sense. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's something that I think a lot of people of color just have, yeah. you know, sort of, sort of instinctively. Yeah. And they might not be able to explain exactly why. It's right. not scientific, but it's yeah. just, you know. Yeah. I, one of the areas that I felt uh, I felt un uncomfortable, I even at the kitchen, you know, with a uh, you know a downtown theater crowd and things, was uh, actually in the very some of the first pieces in the in the piece where there's sort of a minstrel show going on and there's this these guys dancing and and being very physical and you know really like entertainers, um, but it was had so much connections to that uh, sorry history in a certain way that it felt the audience was kind of like into the entertainment quality of it all and we like cheering them on and things like that and I just felt I felt at that moment a little uh, <laughs> discomfort or something. Yeah. I, does that happen on many nights? Oh yeah, that? yeah, yeah. It's 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 uh, but it's very mixed, you know. Uh, like it's now people have like all sorts of different reactions and I would say the majority of people experience what you experience, uh, which is that sort of discomfort. Yeah. Huh. Well, I wondered um I, I was curious, you know, how you're feeling with uh, a lot of press attention and uh, the shipment being really successful and, and you know, Songs of Dragons having been successful in church too. Um, you know, does it, do you feel like you're now in a different place and that it, in some ways you have to somehow protect a role as a provocateur or as an outsider even though there's a main, there's a sort of growing mainstream acceptance of your work in a certain way? I mean, how, oh, how does that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I haven't thought about that too much. Um, I think, you know, my next show is definitely not provocative in that particular huh. way. I uh. mean, like, my next show is a really loose adaptation of King Lear, and the challenge huh. for that is, like, I've always done comedy, right. and I want to do, like, a hardcore Aristotelian tragedy huh. about that moment in a person's life when you realize that your parents are getting old, and they're going to get sick, and you're, they're going to be your responsibility, and they're going to die, and that the same thing's going to happen to you, and right. this, this moment of sort of mortality and the sort huh. of, like, tragedy of that, you know, and, like, just tackling death. Huh. Um, and I feel like that's very much in keeping with that's going to be just a huge challenge it's right, going to be really sure. difficult for me huh. um, and in what way uh, oh just because you know, first of all, like tragedy, like, you know, of that, I mean, comedy is really hard, right. but like tragedy, it's like new, I haven't done it before. Right, sure. And to do it in this day and age, right. like it's not very modern, it's yeah. not very contemporary, yeah. you know? And so to try to like, you know, work with this really old fashioned, kind of genre and way of engaging with the audience and seeing right. if you can sort of pull people into that state. And and also psychologically, it's incredibly difficult because it's like my dad's really sick right now right. and I can't really inhabit that place of tragedy or I wouldn't be able to function, you yeah, know, but it's right. like, you know, just, you know, referencing Aristotle, like making a show in which people, you know, such as myself or even people who haven't had any experience with this come in and they just really emotionally inhabit that moment uh. and you're like allowed to weep and like feel right you know because right. it's yeah made up you know and just trying to achieve that and I feel like um, that's sort of in keeping with what I've been doing yeah. along the same lines but it's not you know it's not dealing sure. with like any political content or like right. you know race or anything right. like that and so but I you know I don't 
I, you know, in a way, I guess I don't feel. I mean, maybe I'll have anxiety about that at some point, you right. know. And but but um, but but I feel like what uh, I really do feel like what is getting what what people are responding to. I don't know about the press, but mm -hmm. in, you know, in terms of like individual audience members, right. I really feel like what they're responding to is the the, the care that goes into making the shows right. and the and the style and like yeah. the approach and the sort of like the spirit behind it. Right. And um, you know, and and so I feel like. You know, I don't need to um, like be a provocateur or something yeah, like in right. order for that in order for that to happen. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed and I really um, uh, admire is is the level of detail that you take and how much you um, are concerned about all, all aspects of your work, and that unlike maybe another kind of playwright, you you're really there um, on, on every detail and and really concerned about how every aspect of this work you know all the design elements and all of the performers choices and everything is going to lead to a cumulative effect and um, do you see a, 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 a day when um, you won't be able to do that as much because you have works of yours out being produced elsewhere and things like that is that a concern at all or yeah um, I mean that's another really good question um, you know, I don't really know what's going to happen at this point. I'm like seriously, like right now. I mean, you've got me at a moment that I'm completely, you know, I've 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 gotten to this certain level. Right. And at this point, like the kinds of meetings that I'm having yeah. are like way beyond right. like any. <laughs> I mean, it's like ridiculous the uh, meetings that I'm having right. now. And so, you know, we don't. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. You know. So, you know, and and. Um, you know, in terms of control, it's like the bigger the venue, like the bigger sure. the, 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 you know, and I mean, it's like I'm talking to film production companies wow, now, you huh. know, about writing and directing like a the Hollywood feature oh, film. Like gosh, I'm talking to major great. studios yeah. about that. Yeah. And so, you know, at that, that just came point, out of people seeing your work or reading about it. Well, it's been happening to... for the past two years. Oh, that's right. Actually. In fact, we talked I've, about it in, in when you were last year with, with Songs of Dragon. Yeah, yeah. Ever, yeah, as soon as Songs hit, like yeah. it was just, you know, that started happening and mm. I was like not ready. And now, you know, I'm feeling sort of like more ready to to reach a broader audience, mm. you know. Do you think people saw songs uh, and your other work as having a uniquely cinematic, you know, potential? Um, and, and do you yourself uh, are you excited about moving into fi making film in, in, in that that language? I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know that they. Um, I think what they saw was just like the the quality of the writing. Right. You know. I mean, yeah. I, I really. I mean, I don't think like a lot of Hollywood people saw the show. Right. You know, and I don't think that my shows are particularly cinematic. I mean, I think theater and film are right. so different. I mean, yeah. so what I've been doing now is I've been like training myself, like uh. to. I'm like I'm like retraining my brain mm. to think in images and uh. to like think to think like a filmmaker uh. before I try to write a screenplay you know because right, everybody's sure. like just whip one out you yeah, know right. and it doesn't work that way <laughs> write like, a play you and have cut to, half the words out or yeah, or yeah 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 exactly like you really have to know how um, you know you it's it's like a different mindset it's a right. totally different mindset like yeah. you can't huh. um, you can't approach, it's a totally different instrument, right, you know? Right, right. Um, and it helps, you know, it's like, you know, if you can play one instrument, it's like, you know, sure. easier to learn another probably, but it's like mm. a totally different instrument. So that, huh. you know, that's definitely gonna be a big challenge oh, to see. I mean, I don't even know if I can, interesting. you know, yeah. can do it, but you know, it's like if I, you know, if I really retrain my brain, I think there's a possibility. So it's, well, a, but, but, but I mean, in terms of like, you know, losing control over my work, um, that's a really big issue. Right. It's a really big issue right yeah. now. And right. you know, at some point I may I may let go. Right. You know, it's going to be really sure. difficult for me. Right. In fact, it, you, it this uh, preceded a question I had which was slightly in a different direction around that my assumption was that your work having been given birth in the downtown, more experimental theater kind of venues and then these contemporary art centers and European festivals that have supported your work I'm uh, presumed that you're getting approached by lots of larger scale regional theater producing companies yeah. um, and now film companies as well, or film producers and things. And, and was that question of, you know, the, the relative merits of that enhanced kind of support and product, you know, the producing of what a regional theater company can do versus these venues like this <laughs> or uh, other places that 
believe in your work, but don't, you know, don't have similar resources or, you know, set in costume shops and this and that. But also what the potential downsides of, of that, you know, that kind of system of work, because I think there's challenges sometimes of being able to control your final, you know, your final product. And that whether you, you approach that world with trepidation or with, um, with joy, you know, uh, or, or whether you even make those distinctions that much uh, between those. Well, I have incredibly mixed feelings. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, because it's true that I've really had like the ultimate luxury as an artist, like doing these downtown venues, doing the art centers, you right. know, like where, you know, the artistic directors are really like, we trust you to yeah. do whatever you want. Right. Like do, you right. know, you do your thing. Yeah. And, right. um, you know, and... Which some in the regional theater artistic direction world say it's an abdication of our artistic responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Well, I mean, you know, but, it, but it's like, and we're not going to like freak out on yeah. you if you don't sell out all the tickets. Yeah, you right, know, like we're right. not going to put that kind of pressure on yeah. you, but it's really about fostering, you know, new, exciting, risk-taking work, Absolutely, you know, and so, right. and so I feel like that's been incredibly luxurious. I'm uh, super, super spoiled, huh. like over the top spoiled from, you know, right. uh, but, you know, to some extent, um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because my work tends to be kind of audience specific yeah you know it's it's like I had a meet you know I was I got a commission from Playwrights Horizons oh, and okay, their right. average audience member is over 50 years old right. and I've never <laughs> right. had that kind of audience sure. before so I, 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 I scheduled a meeting with them and we sat at the table and I was like look you need to tell me who your audience is right you need to tell me what they like what they don't like like who they are what they were you know what the yeah. demographic is you need to explain that right you know so that you know, because my shows are so audience centered, yeah. you know, so that I know how to get them. Oh, interesting. You know, and so to that extent, you know, it's, and, and it'll be interesting to see how that works because if it turns out that that audience, what they can take. Right is too limited, yeah. then that's going to be a real problem for me. Because then you may have to just walk away from that world. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. So we'll, 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 we'll have to wait and see. I mean, you know, it's interesting. Like, I've been so scrappy, like, do it yourself, right. you know, like, yeah. really, really committed and, you know, just you know, not worrying about money, like, not worrying about any right. of that stuff. Yeah. Like, I've really been very, um, uh, very open. And, you know, as it's weird, like within the past six months or so, you know, it's like I'm about to hit 35. Right. Suddenly, yeah. all of that is trickling away. Right. I'm like, I'm, I'm, yeah. I feel like I'm getting old. I'm getting right. tired. I don't have yeah. as much energy. Like, I want to just show up and have the casting agent take care of everything. Right. You know, right. like I want to, <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't want to have to be worrying about dry cleaning. Yeah, you know, like right. I just exactly. want everything to yeah. be taken care of. Right. And, you know, and, and there's that level of growth also where you're just getting older and you just need more support. Right. And, you yeah. know, you can't run yourself ragged yeah, forever. So, right. you know, it's it's going to be interesting yeah. to see what the trade-off is. Yeah. You know, I was um, I, I, I find it so interesting um, your relationship with audience because, on the one hand, I think um, the work that I've known of yours is really interested in, pro in some ways, provoking or prompting response and a whole range of responses from audiences. And you have uh, you've shown to be a great have a great deal of um, courage and fortitude around um, that, not really writing for uh, necessarily what an audience wants, but uh, work that will, in some ways, test an audience a bit. Um, and at the same token, you're very tuned into audiences. I mean, you, you, you're in the house every night, you listen. Just what you said about, you know, who is your audience, and uh, even the willingness to consider writing a play toward a certain age audience and things. It's quite a departure from, say, the experimental artists of the 70s that I know and who at a certain moment or 80s who is like the audience does not matter this is mm -hmm, my work and mm -hmm. I don't could care less I even if barely there's an audience there or not and I wondered if you feel like your generation has a different rela of experimental artist has a different relationship with audience than maybe previous generations of experimenters did um. Uh, you know, I think there's still a lot of that, you uh -huh. know, like, of, yeah. of, like, I make work for myself, and I, you know, you're not supposed to And if you don't get it, audience. that's your problem. And yeah, then, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do And how I do you feel, feel about that, that attitude? Or, uh, um, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like if that's how you make work, then that's right. what you need to do. Yeah. And for me, it's, like, totally the opposite. Like, huh. I'm really into, like, market testing. Like, once I, you know, I'm totally freaking out these Hollywood studios, because I'm like, I want your creative input, because I don't know my audience. Like, huh. I don't know how this business 
this, you know, I don't know how things circulate, sure, you know, right. and it's like the opposite of most artists yeah, who are like, right. I don't want your fingers in yeah, that, exactly, you know, right. and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, for me, you know, it, it's like when you talked about my relationship to the audience, the first thing that popped into my head is I'm trying to trap them and yeah. you catch more, you know, flies with honey, you huh. know, so I think huh. that's why, you know, so it's like, right. it's like trying to trap them so that they can't escape your clutches, yeah. but making it, you know, the way that you trap them is right. by entertaining them. Huh. That's interesting. And sort of supporting them, yeah. you know, and, right. and, and my audience is definitely my nemesis in some extent, like to some extent, like when we're sitting in the room, the audience, it's like us against the audience. When you you're know? sitting, what do you mean? It's in, like combat. In the room when the, you're making a piece or when you're actually in the it's theater? It's like war strategy. When yeah, we're in right. the studio, rehearsal uh -huh, studio, right. like strategizing the piece, it's yeah. like war, you know? <laughs> and it's like, this is our opponent. We predict their move. Like this is gonna right. be our counter move. Like we predict this move and huh, that move. Right. And the way that, but but it's weird because the enemy is also us. Yes, you know? right, so right. It's, it's and it's not considered a success if they stand up and walk out ne necessarily, although people do that with your work. Um, uh, but that's not. We uh, haven't had a single knock on wood. We haven't had a single walkout with the no. shipment. No. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. been. Yeah, it's it's not a. Yeah, I'm definitely don't get excited when people walk out. So you're not a some because there's other pieces and art artists that I work with that are like, yeah, the best shows are the ones that half the people leave and half the people stay. Right, and, right, know, right, uh, right. Yeah, no, I don't. Um, I don't feel that at all. Way yeah, at all. I'm right. always I'm always heartbroken when people leave. Uh, you know, but not that many people leave. No, like right. in general. Yeah. I wondered if we could, uh, I've, I'm winding up toward the last few questions, but um, I was interested in where you see yourself placed in the world of, of writing and play, playwriting in particular, in that there seems to be often this distinction made between a, the classic, classical playwrights, of, uh, even, even up through modernists of you know, Ionesco and Beckett and uh, Genet and, you know, others, uh, Pinter, and, and then the sort of experimental world, which I know you feel, uh, have, have been quoted as me feeling aligned to of Foreman and uh, maybe Mac Wellman is in that world and mm -hmm. um, Liz LeCompte and other, you know, this kind of separate and where you see yourself placed. Are you part of a continuum of writers who are these pl great, you know, the playwrights uh, that we think of in that pantheon, or are, do you see yourself as part of the experimental, more interdisciplinary, almost performance world in some way, and or is the dis dichotomy a false one? Oh, I think it's totally a true dichotomy. Like uh -huh. it's one that's really present for me all the time, and I think I'm sort of like lingering, floating, sort of like awkwardly between the two. Uh -huh. You know, I'm definitely right. not, you know, I'm really strongly influenced by the performance people because that's who I learned from, you uh -huh. know, and then, uh, you know, but at the same time, I have this really strong literary background. Right. And my plays are very literary. And so I think, you know, in terms of my few, I mean, one of the reasons I'm looking towards film is in terms of my future in yeah. theater, right. it's, it's a little bit murky because there's not, Really, a clear path for a someone clear like path. you. I mean, uh -huh. like you know, there is there is the path. If I stick right now, I feel like I'm more in the world of the Nature Theater of Oklahoma. The, yeah, you know, the Worcester Rich group, Maxwell. Rich, Rich yeah. Maxwell. I feel like I'm definitely more in that category professionally. Uh -huh. Right. Um, you know, in terms of how my career is going, but you know, to be honest, I feel like that career trajectory is very short lived because it's kind of like a lot of it is about being the new thing. Yeah. Right. You know. Right. And you know, I had a conversation with Tim from Force sure. Entertainment, and yeah. he said, well, if you just stay, then that's how you become, huh. you know, like huh. that's how you become like the, the really important company. Huh. You just stick it out and you manage <laughs> to stay. Right. And, um, huh. and so that, that's something that's sort of like, you know, stuck in my mind, sure. but it's just, I, I'm so disappointed in myself, but I'm so, as I'm just getting older, yeah. I'm just getting older, huh. I don't want to do casting myself, right. you know, like right. it's just right. happening and I have no control over it, you yeah, know, so sure. it's, it's, um, you know, it would be, it would be kind of great, I think, if I could just like stick out this path and become this really like, you know, important, you know, experimental auteur, right. like, you know, 10 years down the, 10, 20 years down the line. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure if I want to live like that, yeah, you know, right, and it's sure. so fickle and it's so heartbreaking and right. it's just so hard. And yeah. then this other path, you know, which the doors are opening to me, like sure. right at this moment right. of like the theater world, Yeah. you know, it's like, 
I don't know if I can, you know, I, I don't fit there. Yeah. And they kind of know that too. Huh. So I, I can see like this. Like the conversation with Guthrie the other night. Yeah, I can, see, I can see this like conversation going through the, the regional theater artistic director's mind of, wow, like she's got a hit. Right. Like she's got something there. Yeah. But, you know, right. it's like, how do we work with her? Yeah. Like she wants right. to direct, she wants to, you know what I yeah, mean? It's sure. like really, you know, there was definitely like one major regional theater that was like, we're really interested, huh. but we can't let her direct. And, you know, and, and my agent was like, I don't understand that. And I emailed her back and I was like, it makes perfect sense to me. Like mm. I don't have experience working with their audiences, right. with their style of theater, like in their theater. Like sure. I can totally understand why they wouldn't want me to direct, you right. know? So it's just right. a question of, you know, um, and I and I don't really see in theater like where I can go, right. and so that's why I'm sort of starting to look towards film hmm. because that also it expands my audience. Sure, definitely. Well, there is some some promising things I see, you know, with some companies where, and I think oddly enough that the fiscal crisis is um, driving some theaters to sort of be a bit more open to inviting ERS in to just produce the shows the way they produce them, or mm -hmm. you know, to have. Um, artists kind of take more control in some ways, but um, I hope if that's of interest that you know that that those things happen for you as well. Uh, yeah, I mean that's definitely one of the. Ho I mean the fact that I'm even getting these meetings, you yeah, know, sure. it's it's definitely you know right. it signals something because right. the shipment is not a conservative yeah. show. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, huh. we'll see what happens. It's kind of a weird time because it's like yeah. a, you know we're, you. You really don't know what's going to happen next. It's like all of these doors have opened; sure. and it could just go nowhere. So, speaking of a weird time, um, I guess my last question is: if you could want to comment, and we're in the, this very weird time in the country, <laughs> yeah. where it's incredibly <laughs> hopeful with uh, Barack Obama as president and all these great new policies on a daily basis, yeah. which seems so enter, you know exciting and, and energized and right, right. My, I mean, really clear-minded. On the same token, we seem to be in some kind of economic um, decline that's um, close to unprecedented, and I wondered what your, how you navigate the balances of hope versus desolate, you know, desperation around these questions, and where you see the world of the kind of theater that we're both somewhat part of, and contemporary art and things surviving in, in this in these coming years. Um, it's, it, you know, that's such a difficult question because it is so crazy. Like right. that situation that you described is just insane. You right. know, it's really right. difficult to get your bearings because you really don't know what's going to happen right. with Obama, with the economy. And, and the thing that's a little bit weird is like, you know, you hear about like 80,000 people losing their jobs. Right. And it hasn't started to, it started to affect me a little bit with like state, you know, with sure. like state funding, right. you know, government funding, yeah. like for the arts is really in jeopardy. Yeah. And so that, right. you know, and, and foundations actually like just because of the fine you know they're also so right. it's like I'm kind of seeing you know and how we're affecting Europe so that's how that's gonna affect touring so I'm looking down the line towards a financial crisis potentially for my company right and might not being right. able to support myself you know and yeah. then like the dearth of jobs right um, so I, I I mean in a, you know in some sense that's also why I'm looking to get out you know right. because I feel sure. like you know I feel like theater is um, do you feel like the theater theater has a future uh, in the Amer in America? Uh. I definitely think like, that it has a future. I feel like it's going about it the wrong way right now. It's making itself uh, irrelevant by aping television and movies right. instead of being the thing that it is that yeah. is so unique, you right. know. And um, you know, I think that. Uh, straight narrative theater is right. it, that's going to die out. Like yeah. I don't feel like that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. I feel like the musical. The big Broadway musical right. has some potential for mm. like interesting things to happen, right. you know, new because that's something new, yeah. that's something you can't, you know, that's something unique, right. you know, that's like yeah. something really, you uh -huh. know, and so I think, you know, and I think some of these young compa new companies that are coming out are doing like really. I don't know, I kind of feel like theater will, all, you know, when I think about theater in terms of like that narrative drama theater, sure. I think eventually that will probably die because mm -hmm. it'll just get killed because it's not as good as television and movies right. and it's just, right. it's getting worse and worse, you yeah. know, so that, 
But in terms of like the kind of work that the Walker does, the kind of work that's getting done at these experimental theaters, right. I mean, just historically, you always need the weirdos. Like right. that's where, yeah. you know, like the art sure. happens, right. you know, and that's where innovation happens. Yeah. And, you know, Samuel Beckett was a weirdo, you right. know, like, yeah. and right. so I don't really see that going, going away. away. Like, yeah. I mean, it seems to be getting stronger, if anything, you know, right. and it's like, yeah. you know, and with, you know, with Obama, with this new hope, you know, with these younger people who are more hopeful and like, you know, um, uh, more open, right. you know, I have a feeling that there's like tremendous potential for theater yeah. at the same uh. time that I feel like it's, you know, it's, it's making itself irrelevant. Right. So it's just, there's so much contradiction and uncertainty right yeah. now. Right. Um, it's, it's a definitely like a confusing time. Yeah. Well, Young Jean Lee, thank you for taking this time, and uh, I think we're we're done. Great. Any last things you felt like you wanted to say? No, to but those were like the hardest questions I've gotten like all <laughs> month. I've oh. been getting yeah, yeah, definitely. Good. I, I yeah, hope that's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. It is good. Like you know, questions that I like that send me into a tailspin are right. definitely like good <laughs> questions.